off, what we're going to do today is starting off with a review from yesterday. So, Kush will be showing you guys how to cut a belly pan. So, that just synthesizes a lot of the patterning, maybe in a more advanced format than what we went over yesterday, but it's the same thing. So, for CAD, I think in general, a lot of the concepts that we have are pretty simple, but it's how we combine them that can get a little complicated. So, you'll be doing a lot of work along with us. I hope all of you guys submitted your homework. If you guys didn't, make sure to send it right now at the beginning of class. After Kush uh, has us through that, and as a review, you guys will um, we'll go over homework. And then after that, I have a short presentation that I want to share with you guys on mechanisms. So maybe going more in depth than the discussion that we had yesterday. And then I'll also be showing you guys how to start uh, downloading parts off the web, importing parts, and making assemblies. So those are two main things today. And then afterwards, we will do, um, and then afterwards, we'll talk briefly about tomorrow's test. And then I think that's our main plans for today. So, uh, let me see here. Hmm, my team seems being a little bit odd. Coach, are you there? Yeah, I'm here. Do you have your camera on? No, I don't. Okay. No, but I have like this big black screen on my, uh, black black screen on my computer, and I was wondering who that is. Wait, is that me? Yeah, I think that's you. Mahim, I oh. can see you. It's just a big black box. It, it it wasn't working earlier. Wait, can I like leave and then rejoin? Yeah, yeah. Go ahead. Okay. So while Mahim it is that. Um. Yeah, Coach, do you wanna go ahead and screen share and get started? Oh, yeah. You guys see me now? Yeah. Okay. All right. Do you guys see my screen? Yeah. You can go ahead. Yeah. Cool. Uh, oh, so. Quick note. You guys just chat along. We'll make you send a picture of this, too. It's good practice. Sure. Uh, so I'll go a bit more slowly then. Uh, so for those of you guys that don't know, the belly pan is just like the bottom part of the robot. That's why it's called the belly of the robot, I guess, or the belly pan. Um, and usually it's like it consists of a lot of patterned holes so we'll be using a lot of rectangular patterns and extrusions and stuff like that uh so we'll get started by creating a 2d sketch and we'll go into the xy plane okay um let's start by making a rectangle we'll use a two-point center rectangle and we'll start in the middle uh let's make it one inch tab two inch enter all right, so your rectangle should be black, which means it's fully constrained. Um, and then after that, I'm thinking of doing maybe some sort of diamond pattern in the middle, and that will be kind of our holes in the belly pan. So let's see. To make a diamond, what you can do is start off by making clicking on the line tool and then making a horizontal line that, let's say, it's 0 0.1 inches. Yeah, I think that works. Yeah, there we go. Move that. All right, and then let's make another line that goes off kind of down. That's 0 0.1 inches long as well. And remember, we're trying to make some sort of diamond shape here, so maybe something that goes like that. Um, we'll also make another line that's 0 0.1 inches long. All right. So once that's done, press Escape. And then we'll try to put all of this together using some constraints. So we'll use the coincidence constraint. So press on one of the points here, and then this point, and it should put it together. And then press on this point here, and this point, and that should put it all together. Um, so this is basically an equilateral triangle. Um, and to make this a diamond, uh, we can make like another line, but instead of that, we'll like use the mirroring tool. So I'll press escape, and let's go to pattern and mirror. So to select, we'll select what we want to mirror across. So we'll select this line and this line. And then the mirror line, we'll make this horizontal line. So let's do that. And then press apply. All right, there we go. So now we have what's basically a diamond or even a rhombus. Press done. All right, so we have that there. Um, what I want to do is, let's see. First, I want to make it so that I can kind of access this. Actually, you know what? We don't have to. Uh, since we're not going to be using this line in the center over here, we can hold shift and press this line and go to format and make it a construction line. All right, and then press escape. 
All right, so you can see this line is dotted now. And what I want to do is kind of make a copy of this rhombus or this diamond. And so the way I can do that is kind of uh, start from the bottom right and pull up. And it should highlight everything. And then I can go to Modify and press Copy. And let's select a base point. Uh, so the base point is like from where you want to start and how much you want to move the copy. In this case, it really doesn't matter since we didn't constrain anything. So there, that's good. And then press Escape. So now we have two copies of this sort of diamond shape. And what I want to do is put all of these diamonds onto this rectangle, rectangle and make a pattern out of that. And once that's over, we'll just extrude the whole thing. All right, so let's move this diamond around here. So if you guys can kind of imagine what I'm trying to do here, I'm trying to kind of put all these diamonds in a row like this, going all the way across and down. And then this diamond will kind of fill in the gaps, right? I think it'll make more sense once I actually make the rectangular pattern, so you guys see what I mean. So first thing I want to do is constrain this diamond over here. So the way I'll do that is go to Constrain and press Dimension. Um, and then I'll select this point and this line. Let's make that 0 0.1. Yeah. And then after that, I will select this point and this, and let's make this 0 0.1 as well. Very cool. So this one's black. It's fully constrained. And let's see, what do I want to do with you? Press escape. And I want it so that this is like pretty close to this. Let's uh, let's make this around 0 0.2 inches away from this. So let's press constrain. Press the top part and this. And let's make that 0 0.2. This is all in inches, by the way. Uh, really, I'm trying to go for the shape here. I don't think like the dimensions would actually make sense for an, you know, an actual robot. Um, and then let's just move this for where we want it. So now you'll see I'll be able to move, press escape. Uh, I should be able to move this up and down. Yeah, since I restrained it from this, uh, since I restrained this horizontal length or constrained it, I'm only able to move this up and down. So let's just put it, I don't know, there it sounds, looks around good, All right? Okay, yeah, that's good. All right, press escape. So now we have two different diamonds and now we can create the pattern out of this. So the way I want to do this is go to the pattern tool and select rectangular pattern. By the way, all of this is a review of what we did in the past. And then I can just select everything I want to make a pattern out of. So first I want to make a pattern out of this diamond over here. So let's select all of that. Yeah, that works. And then for first direction, we can go here. Notice how this arrow is pointing right. So that's the proper direction. You can also press this arrow if you want to go the other way, but we want to go this way. Um, and then for a second direction, let's go down. So notice how this arrow points up. We don't want that. So we'll press this button and it'll go down. All right, that looks good. And for the distance between, so you'll notice how a one inch distance between each, I guess, I don't know, pattern uh, is too big, right? So we want to make it a bit smaller. So let's make this 0 0.2. Oh yeah, that looks good. See, now it's over here. I don't know if you guys can see that gray outline right there. That's where the pattern is going to go. And let's make this, I don't know, 0 0.3, 0 0.2. Yeah, let's make it 0 0.2. And let's see, how many do we want? So for this top one, let's go four, five. Yeah, five works. And then let's go 10 down. Uh, I think that's a bit too much. Let's go nine. All right, there we go. And then after that, press OK. All right, there we go. So now we see a pattern over here. And what we want to do is also have like a diamond in the center of I don't, know, I don't know if you guys can imagine, but a diamond in the center of all of these. And I'll create a really nice looking pattern. That will be the belly, belly pen. So what I want to do next is go to my pattern tool again and then select everything I want to make a pattern out of. So that looks good. Yep. And then basically the same thing. Um, this is just basically a copy of what I did for this top left one. So direction, I want to go this way. It goes in that direction. That's good. For this one, I want to go that's up. So let's make it go down. That's good. Um, since this diamond is going in between these, I think for this one, I'll only need four. And let's also make this 0 0.2. Let's make this 0 0.2 as well. And then for down, I don't know, does 10 work? Nope, it does not. Nine. 
nine looks about right. Might be a bit too much, let's do eight. And then press OK. All right, there we go. So now we have this really nice looking pattern, kind of like a grill shaped pattern on this rectangle. And now all that's left to do really is just extrude everything that's not a hole. So you can go ahead and press finish sketch. All right, and now let's just create an extrusion. And be careful to highlight everything that's not a diamond. So that should automatically work. And then let's see, <laughs> that's too big. Let's go 0 0.03. That looks about right. And then let's do it symmetrical. All right, there we go. And press OK. My computer is being a bit laggy. OK, yeah. there we go. So that's basically your belly pan. Um, you can look at the front view over here. That's basically how it looks. Um, obviously, you can do different shapes and all that. But for now, I just use the diamond shape. Um, you can also like go ahead and change the material. So let's say I want to make it. Let's make it. I don't know. Let's make it gold because why not? And it's loading. All right, there we go. So yeah, that's your belly pan. Any questions? Right. So basically, all the topics that I went over, basically just extrusions, creating a sketch, and rectangular patterns. It's basically what I went through here. Very simple. All right. Yeah. I think there's no questions. Yeah, so if you guys have questions, you guys can feel free to ask. And as Coach mentioned, this is just one way of making a value pan. During the actual season, the way you make it is a little bit different. But this is a really good way to practice your patterning skills. Um, so when you guys submit it, instead of submitting it, like an image of it just like this, make sure to fill it, in, change the material, and then uh, snap a picture of it and save it. Mm -hmm. uh, and then we'll be asking them for that later. Yeah, you can go ahead and show them how to fill it in right now if you want. Oh, wait, that's way too much. Um, OK, yeah, so what I did over here, I just pressed modify and pressed fill it. Uh, normally, oh wait, Sonic, normally do you guys fill out the actual holes as well? Actually, normally when we fill out it, we don't really fill out the edges, because if you think about the manufacturing process, we fill out all the inside individual edges. Okay, then like, for now it's fine, because then I have to like, pattern it all again, but I guess, I guess I can just do it for like one of them. So, so first one. Just fill it, fill it the, uh, the corners. Like fill out the corners and then make a pattern? No, 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 corners of the rectangle. Oh, it's like this, like this part right here. Yeah, that one. Because that's, uh, like, like Sana was saying, when you think about the fabric, uh, the creation of it, we normally fill those, obviously a small degree, just because um, fitting will just make more sense. But also, obviously, inside the pattern, you do it. But obviously, you do it before you extrude it. Um, you have a different process for it, obviously. You know, I'm sure you'll get to that later. Got it. Yeah, so basically what I'm doing, just pressing fill it and then selecting this corner edge over here. It lights up green, so I'll just select that. And then it already says 0 0.05. This is in inches, by the way. I press OK. Yep, so that's basically filleting. Anything else? Does no one have any questions? OK. Uh, I'm going to call on someone. We have a little bit less people than usually today. Uh, hmm. Arnav, what did you think of the belly pan? Uh, my thing crashed, so I'm still a little behind on it. So I need help because uh, my inventor crashed. So can you go over the diamond part again? Yeah, sure. Um, OK, so let me go here. Let's create a sketch. OK, so the way I created a diamond, I mean, I don't know if this is the most efficient way. I don't really think there's like a rhombus or diamond shape in Autodesk. Someone correct me if I'm wrong, one of the leads. Um, but the way I did it is just I created a line. 
All right, I'll make this a bit bigger just for demonstration purposes. Let's say this is one inch. All right, and this line is not going to be part of the actual final, I guess, shape. I'll eventually make this a construction line. So then after that, create another line that goes from here. Oops, I don't mean to do that. Another line that goes from here to maybe, why is it doing that? All right, all right. Try that again. Make another line. Yeah, okay, there we go. Uh, we'll make this the same dimension as the first one, so let's make it one inch. It doesn't really matter what angle you go off later because we're going to constrain everything. So press escape, create another line that goes like this, one inch, enter. All right, notice how all these are purple because we haven't constrained it anywhere yet. Uh, go to your constraints, and then we're going to use the coincident constraint. Uh, coincident, uh, yeah, coincident constraint. Uh, and what that basically does is it makes sure it makes sure two points are in the exact same location, right? So I want this point right here. I should zoom in maybe a little bit. This point right here to be in the same location as this point, right? Make sure it's green and then select it. And notice how both of them are in the exact same location, right? And then I want to make sure this point and this point are in the same location. So there you go. Um, the way the geometry works, I don't really have to do anything else to kind of make it symmetrical. So that works good. Um, and then I press escape. And then the way I kind of create the other part of the diamond is I just mirror it across the center line. Um, so what I do there is go to pattern, press mirror. All right. And then this first select part, I want to select what I want to mirror. So I want to select this part and this part. right? And then I want to mirror it across this line. So I press mirror line and I select that. right? And then I press apply. And then you see it becomes like that, right? Press done. And in my final thing, I did not want this line in the middle, so I could have just, I could have deleted it, I could have made it a construction line. Uh, so the way to make it a construction line is you want to first select it. So hold shift, and then, so hold shift, and then press this line. It should become blue. And then go to format and press construction. All right. And then it becomes dotted. Is that all you wanted, or do you want me to go over more? Uh, yeah, so I got the diamond, but uh, what am I supposed to do after that to create the pattern? Oh, okay, okay. So, uh, okay, let's do this. Let's create another rectangle somewhere. All right, like that. All right, so the way I made the pattern out of this is first I kind of constrained this diamond somewhat. So let's move it here. And let's put it top left. Uh, honestly, I'm just eyeballing it here. And then what I can do, like, I mean, you could constrain it, but for now, you just want to see how the pattern works. So rectangle pattern. And then I want to select everything I want a pattern, right? So the way I do that, I can just do this, and it selects everything, right? And now I want to pattern it. So first, I have to select, since this is two dimensions, I want to select the two different dimensions or directions I want to pattern it. So I'll use this tool or this pointer, and then select this side, right? And notice how the arrow is pointing to the right, which means it's going to pattern to the right. I don't know if you can see that outline right here. It goes to the right. And then I want to go to the other direction. So use this pointer and select this side. And notice how that says up, right? And the thing goes up. We don't want that. We want it to go down. So I'll just press this button right over here, and it goes down, right? And then you just change so remember this first direction was this side going left and right so how much do i want to move it i don't know i'm just eyeballing it two inches maybe you know that looks like too much 1.5 sure why not 1.5 inches and then down i want it to go two inches i don't know yeah it looks a bit so two inches right and then the last step is just selecting how much you want to do it so how much I, how many pattern i want to go right and how many I want to go down, right? So for right, let's eyeball it, maybe five. Yeah, five is good. And then down, I want to go seven. That's just perfect, yeah. And then press OK. And see how I made the pattern there. Did that make sense? Yeah. All right, sweet. Any other questions? Uh, I'm going to call on someone else.
Arjun, what did you think of the demo that uh, Chris just showed us? Yeah, I got all of it. It was, yeah. Compared to yesterday, do you think it was uh, the difficulty? Was it easier or was it harder? Uh, I think the rectangular pattern was pretty easy and then everything else was pretty basic. So I think it was easier. Okay, that's good. Uh, that's nice. So Drew just dropped in our meeting now. So I think, uh, Chris, you can go ahead and stop screen sharing. Thank you for the demo. Drew will go ahead and let us go over some homework. Okay, give me a second for that. Yeah, yeah. Okay, guys. But uh, let me just chat briefly about the test tomorrow. Tomorrow, since it's the last day of boot camp, you guys have been here every single day for over an hour. We're not going to keep you obviously until eight. Uh, but before, we're not going to just come here and straight up take the test because the test is multiple choice. It's not meant to be super difficult. So we're probably only going to give you half an hour. Uh, or 45 minutes to do it uh, and then uh, so it's not going to take the whole time so beforehand we're going to do the same thing as usual we're going to still check in homework we're not going to teach any new CAD content tomorrow but we will be doing some uh, probably maybe another slideshow or something like that okay uh, so yeah Drew whenever you're ready go ahead and screen share uh, and we can go down and Um, okay, so the first one I have is Monos. Sorry, give it a second. Mana, where are you on? Mana? I think you dropped off. Okay. I mean, uh, I don't think we have to go over the sprocket because it's going to be standard for everyone, but uh, the material yeah. is very nice. Yeah. Um, you guys see how, like, um, over here, the like the appearance is like the whatever he selected, like the carbon thing, but the material itself is still generic. So to make you have to make sure that the um, both of them stay the same because it's just gonna look like the carbon that he selected, but it's actually gonna be a generic material. So uh, make sure that you guys keep those the same. Uh, yeah, that's fine. Uh, next one was oh. Chris, what is this? Wait, is I have a question. Did Mama yeah. not submit a picture of his superhero? Uh, no, I don't think so. Oh. Uh, Drew, that's Sanjin's homework. I just forwarded. Oh, okay. You mean this in CAD? Or oh, do you change the background? Oh, yeah, I made it in CAD and then I rendered it in EV. Very nice. This is yeah. pretty awesome. That looks good. What, uh, also, I couldn't make the sprocket because um, my in, um, inventor glitched out during boot camp, but I did uh, attach a mo um, 3D model of the superhero logo. Yeah. Okay. Wait, Wait what's super Um, Are you sharing anything right now? Yeah. But he must, I didn't see anything. Your camera's coming in and then coming off. Maybe you should leave again and rejoin. Okay. Okay. Okay, not bad. Um, yeah. Oh. Do you want to walk us through how you made it? Is this your original sketch? Um, no, it's from a movie called Pacific Rim Uprising. Uh, I just inserted an image and then I traced over it. And then I extruded the 2D sketch. How did you trace over? Hmm? How did you trace over? Um, I inserted an image in oh, the. Oh, just inserted the image. Okay. Um, I mean, it it was cool, but uh, what we were trying to get at with the thing was to like practice 
how we would catch something in Inventor, right? So as you can see, like even if you like trace an image, um, uh, like your sketch isn't completely black. Uh, so that means it's not like fully constrained. So if you look at the bottom over here, I see like 248 dimensions needed. So like, because um, if I change one thing, it kind of messes up the whole drawing, right? So uh, you can still trace an image, but make sure to like add dimensions and like specify how long and what angle you want each line to be. So yeah, that's all right. Um, yeah, yeah, you know, I said it didn't look very good. Okay, this one was Arnav Sinha's. Okay. Okay, Sprocket looks nice. Um, so there, there seems to be like some parts of the teeth or whatever that are not extruded out, like or like were part of the cut. So that must have just been like the wrong dimensioning for the rectangle you drew. Um, except for that, I think everything's fine. Also, the, the square is not the center. Yeah, yeah. Um, the square is not centered, so that uh, could just be that uh, when you were drawing the cent uh, circle, um, when you're drawing the square, make sure to draw it on the origin. Um, you can uh, do like a center point rectangle, or you could all you have to do is just like make it symmetric about the origin, and it should be fine. So we'll walk through those things again. So it's just like. Two uh, minor details. And then the Batman logo. You want to walk us through how you did the Batman logo? Uh, sure. So I created an eclipse as the border and I used mm -hmm. the offset. And I created another eclipse and I split it in half. So once I created like once like uh, one side of the Batman logo, I just mirrored it on the other. And oh. then I just uh, used the trim tool and circles to create like the arcs of the oh, Batman wow. logo. Okay. Yeah. How did you like, did you make this like a arbitrary shape or like? Uh, yeah. Because, okay, oh, you like mirrored it over a plane. Over yeah. a plane. Okay, cool. Okay, that's nice. And um, when you were, okay, same thing over here, right? So like your appearance, appearance is gold, but your material is still generic. So you want to make sure that these two are the same thing. So uh, whenever you like want to change the look of something, change the material so this one will automatically change with it unless you override it later so always do the left one like change the material okay let's go pretty good yeah. Yeah. I know. for our purposes it's not super important what material it is because we're not really running that many extensive simulations but in general it's like good practice to change the material and not just the appearance because if you use it later and you're trying to run simulations, you're going to get some weird results. But yeah, it doesn't talk about what's really nice. Really important. Oh, okay, so the next one is uh, Origins. Okay. Um, okay, this is pretty solid. Did, sorry, is he missing a pellet or is this good? It's fine. Okay. You could have had it. Cool. Okay, so this is fine. This is actually pretty good. And you want to walk us through your flash logo? Yeah, so I created two circles and I extruded both of them. I did one more. I did the white one a bit more than the other one. I don't think you can really see it from the front view. And then I just used lines to create a lightning bolt and then extruded it a bit more than both of the circles. And then I used, uh, I think it was called a uh, chamfer on the edges to make it look like, to give it like that. I don't know what to call it, depth, I guess. Like the yeah. edges you like side them? Yeah. Okay, okay. cool. Yeah, I'm glad you decided to go and explore what chamfer was. The logo does look really nice too. I think this is one of the more fun assignments that we guys we give you guys to do. You guys usually have fun with this one. This one looks really nice. Um. Yeah, I think that's it. Okay. I think Mahim also shared something. Yeah. Yeah. Do you want to click through? Wait, Mahim, are you working with the veterans too? No. Okay. You know you can work with them too, right? Um, yeah, but I'm really bad at catting, so I'll just do this one. Okay, that's fine. Yeah, well, I'm comfortable. You want to walk us through this one? Um, yeah, I think this is Black Widow's logo. Mm -hmm. So I just put a triangle in the circle and then mirrored it over the x-axis. And, yeah. 
next pretty good. That's okay. It. Cool. Uh, okay, so just one sketch, but then three extrusions. Oh no, no three extrusions. Okay. Okay. Cool. Um. Okay. Uh, so, so I mean that sort of trippy. Okay. Yeah. So now that you guys um showed us that, I think it gives us as leads a better idea of where you guys are with CAD. And I think a lot of you guys are pretty far along, which is really good. Um, and especially when you guys take the initiative to learn other tools that we didn't teach you, uh, and even stuff maybe that we won't necessarily use during the season, that's always really nice to see. So I think what we're going to do now is go over a slideshow on some mechanisms. Also as a review for drivetrains, because I think some of you guys maybe need a review on that, because uh, sometimes it's hard to pick up on things the first time through. So let me go ahead and share my screen. And we will be doing a mechanism. Okay, you guys can all see my screen, right? So if you have any questions, just unmute and ask them out. Because during the when we start uh, like build season, it uh, we're going to expect you guys to know this information, and it's better if you just have a really solid foundation of it beforehand. Okay, so mechanism. So I'm going to start off by just reviewing drivetrains. So remember that there are two main divisions of drivetrains that I talked about last time. There are tank drives and holonomic drives. So tank drives can move forward and back, but go sideways. There's a lot of friction, so it's pretty hard. Uh, so you're a little bit limited in movement, but a lot of push power. And holonomic drivetrains can turn can move in any direction without having to turn. So I mean, normally when you're like when you're driving a car, you have to like turn it to move. But something like a hollow knob drive train, it could just do something like this, and it can just like move left, right, up, and down. Uh, and it's pretty handy, but for most of them, except for sort of drive, you see that it compromises a little bit of the pushing power, which is usually a little bit more important in FRC. And also, hollow knob drives are just inherently more complicated. So, tank drives, the pros increase pushing power, easier design and program, and simple to drive. The cons are just decreased maneuverability which is why tank drives are so popular for FRC. So for holonomic drivetrains, they have increased maneuverability, but there's a lot of cons when we're thinking about in the context of robotics like FRC, So which is why they're a little bit less popular because they're just harder in general uh, with everything, and they're a little bit more hard on the resources too. They cost more money and more time. So wheel scrub is something that I didn't discuss last time. But essentially, it's when a drivetrain robot uh, turns, the sides of the wheels have to dra drag across the floor, causing friction. So you can see what happens here is when we're turning, what drivetrains will generally do is you have, you have a couple of options. You can either do a zero radius turn, where you have the two sides going in opposite directions. So theoretically, it would just spin in place like this. Obviously, in the real world, friction and all that. That doesn't like exactly happen. Alternatively, you could uh, spin the two sides at different speeds. So you have one side go slow and one side go faster, and then it'll turn like that. Uh, but I think in general, like zero radius turns are what we try to go for. So you can see uh, the diagram, the way that it's annotated. The inside arrows show the wheel direction, and then the corner arrows show the turning direction. And then the small arrows, those are like the wheel dragging that causes the wheel scrub which lowers the efficiency in, uh, the lowers the efficiency of the turning process. So for tank drives, when you're using four wheel, you can use omni wheel to reduce scrubbing. I don't think you really see four wheel drives that much in RC just because there's so much, uh, like robots are so big. Usually what you see more commonly are six and eight wheel drives. And when you do six and eight wheel drives, sort of like what we discussed last time, you really want to have a drop center by at least 16 inch, usually no more than one eighth inch, to reduce scrubbing. So what that does is instead of having like uh, four wheels or four pairs of wheels straight, uh, it's like a little bit like a V, like like this, except not as extreme. So what happens is it rocks back and forth like this. So really, it's just driving on two sets, uh, like a set two, a set of two, a set of four wheels, and then it like rocks like this back and forth. So that's what six and eight wheel drives usually do. So it allows the robot to be on only four wheels when you're trying to turn, which reduces the friction, because otherwise a six wheel, eight wheel, 10 wheel, that would be a lot of friction. 
So a drivetrain example. I'm just going to briefly play this video to show you guys what this looks like. So this is a really simple uh, drivetrain, right? You have the, the six wheels, you have the gearbox, and you have the uh, sprocket for power transmission like we talked about last time. Wait, can you guys hear the sound? I don't think so. I don't think I remember. No, the sound isn't playing. Sound it, you need to reshare. So stop sharing. And when you reshare, there is a option slider on the top right before you share. It says um, turn computer audio on. Yeah. Can you guys see? Uh, you guys can see my screen now. Yes. Okay. Uh, uh, this person has some pretty good commentary, so just listen. WCD, for short, offers many advantages, such as being easily adjustable, easy to maintain and repair, and highly customizable. Yeti Robotics uses this system because we can finish a drivetrain by day three and then immediately focus on other systems. This design is also lightweight and eliminates the need for an outer drive rail. In addition, it allows you to swap gear ratios with relative ease when compared to a standard kit tank drive. One huge advantage is that it does not typically need any fasteners that can come loose because it uses a riveted construction. So not everything that he said was particularly directly applicable, but for the drivetrain, a lot of times you'll hear people refer to as a West Coast Drive or WCD. So this is one of the projects that you guys will be working on leading up to the build season. So we have a set of tutorials that we, you guys are going to be sort of going through partially on yourself, um, and partially with other, uh, like partially by yourself and then partially as a group, uh, in like homework. So uh, we will be doing one of these soon. But you guys can see, even though we did talk about the fact that there is friction, this person didn't really, like their drivetrain didn't use Omni wheels, and you can still move around, so it's not awful. Uh, it's just not co that comparable to like a server or something like that. So West Coast Drive. WCD for short. Okay. So Mechanum Drive, I'm not going to go over this one that much because it's not really pertinent to us. We never make Mechanums, but all we always have to have independent motors, so they're really just not that. Uh, for our purposes. Uh, for Mechanum, you know, what we talked about when you can turn, you don't have to like actually rotate at all when you're moving. Like if you want to move sideways for a tank drive, you'd have to like actually turn. But for Mechanums, you don't have to. You can literally just slide to the side. I think Mechanum is pretty popular in FTC. So I know a couple of you guys did that. So you guys are probably familiar. Or like diagonal movement, you know, you don't have to turn at all. You can just like slide right over, which is really handy. So I'll show you guys another short video of the Mechanum trial. Yeah, there's no point in listening to the audio for this one, but you can see it turns and it's very smooth and it turns really easily. But also, uh, you know, in terms of some of the other things, it's a little bit more hassle-some. If you guys like can see here, there's a gearbox for every single wheel. And usually that's not something we can afford or something that we think it's really worth it to afford. Okay, so this is an Omni wheel. It's sort of like a Mechanum wheel, except uh, the rollers are a little bit more simple. It, I think generally it's cheaper too, but we don't really use them too much. Uh, some, it, it is pretty popular though for some teams to use these on tank drives. They'll use Omni wheels. Nobody really uses Mechanum wheels on tank drives, but Omni wheels you do see sometimes. So Omni wheel drivetrain, so, I mean, you have a lot of different options. So here we have a Kiwi. So Kiwis aren't really something that you'll see very often, but uh, Kiwis are really maneuverable and they use, uh, they're really low traction. Uh, so uh, like to say, say, nobody really uses this in FRC anymore because usually it's not the best approach uh, for like the space efficiency and everything. But it occasionally shows up in FTC. And it's pretty hard to write code for this, so oh, we don't really use it. Four wheel Omni, right? Like, well, like we talked about last time, it's pretty similar to the Kiwi. And then we have the H drive, which allows you uh, to have a traditional tank set up with an additional one in the center. Tank drives are a little bit clunky, in my opinion. Uh, the space, usually you want like to save the center because that's pretty important for something else. But H drives are sometimes justified. So an H drive example is flyby. 
Uh, this was a robot, I think, made by Team 108. Uh, we watch their team's videos a lot because uh, this team, uh, they regularly show up at a World Championships and they regularly win. And their team is really, really amazing in their design process. And uh, they're a really good example to follow. So you'll probably be seeing this team quite a bit. They, this was an uh, excellent demonstration of how to use an extra drive. So you, if you guys can see, it like moves really nicely. I'll just show that again. Can I get a non blurry? Anyway, but in this case, if you guys uh, saw, they used an H drive in there, so it, it basically looks like a tank. Yeah, if you guys can see that here. So it's basically a tank, but they included an extra wheel in the middle to allow it to move pretty easily. So, uh, that's an H drive. Okay. So serve drive, this is something that our team did last year. This is basically just the same content that I went over last time. So this is our team, actually. We haven't really showed you that many um, videos of our team in action. But if you see, uh, in okay, I'm going to turn the sound off because it's really loud. But if you just see here, our team is able to move really fast and easily. Like right here, when we're trying to avoid a robot, we can spin right around them. And it's no problem at all, like with any speed or anything. We don't really get stuck. And you can see, that's why we sort of thought, like, oh, it would probably be good. We move really fast. And this isn't, like, sped up or anything, right? This is just what our robot can move. It can move really fast. It can, uh, like, withstand being pushed around uh, versus for a mechanism drive or, like, an on-wheel drive. Sometimes you just get pushed off to the side. But for us, that wasn't the case. We were able to get around uh, the other people really fast. Okay. So stopping a review from drivetrains yesterday, does anyone have any questions? Um, I have a question. Mm -hmm. uh, sorry, John, to you, just a quick question. Um, I think this presentation is not in the folder. Can you post it in the chat so that I could post it uh, to yeah. the members page? Yeah, I'll do that after. Mahima, I think you had a question. Yeah, I was going to say, do certain wheels like have restrictions when it comes to motors or the amount of wheels you can put on the robot? Is that a thing? Or the amount of wheels you can put on a robot? I don't think FRC says you can only put so and so amount of wheels on a robot because, like we mentioned, besides just like actually using them as wheels on a drive train, we use them a lot in flywheels and intake mechanisms, and wheels is sort of like a really loose definition. So. I think in terms of FRC rules, they don't really have anything. And I think the other part of your question was with motor wheel compatibility. I think that usually depends on the provider a little bit. We'll be going on like different websites later today and actually seeing like how to download uh, stuff right away. And you can just sort of see in CAD uh, like what motors fit with what wheels um, if you're talking in terms of compatibility. Did that answer your question or did you mean something else? No, it didn't. Okay, good. Anyone else have any questions? This is John here. Um, about you know the number of wheels, uh, just for your uh, as an example, in 2016, I believe, Stronghold game. I don't know if you guys remember or not, but that was a game where the uh, the robot has to go over this trench with all kinds of obstacle. Some of the obstacle is like five inches tall, and so some teams have a tank drive, but with actual tank threads. But some teams, um, you know, the tank threads are, are difficult to maintain. And so they created smaller, maybe they use two inch wheels or three inch wheels, but they built probably um, five, six different pairs uh, so that it kind of lays out like a tank track, but it's just small wheels, like six, seven pairs. Uh, that allowed them to climb five, six inches. So the answer is, you can have as many, have as many um, wheels as you want. It just gets more complicated to, to maintain. Yeah, I don't think our team usually opts for too many on our drive train directly, but we do use them a lot uh, in other areas. Uh, wheels are usually pretty handy in FRC. Okay. 
I'm going to go on to manipulators unless anyone else has any questions. Okay. So in F4C, manipulators are just any part of the robot that usually you use to interact with game pieces on the field. So whether that be anything like a ball, which are always really popular, discs, um, or really anything in general. So there's a lot of, uh, manipulators sort of has like a loose definition. So some of the ones that we'll be going over are arms, elevator, shooters, and intake. Uh, so if you remember the telescoping arm that we went over yesterday that our team built, that's sort of an example of an arm, but arms can come in many different shapes and sizes and in forms. So we'll be talking about some of them today. And you guys will get to see more as we look at more robot review videos throughout the season. So arms are generally used to raise and lower cane pieces. And when people say something like an arm, they usually mean something that's more similar or looks more like how a human arm works, something like with a joint, not really like the telescoping arm that we used. Uh, that we showed you yesterday, which is really, really compact, and it sort of just extends out. So arms are usually pretty simple, uh, even though they can get quite complicated, and they have a lot of benefits. Depending on the context, you know, you can it can be simple, it can be robust, it can reach over other um, robots. Um, but in general, uh, when, especially when people talk about arms in the sense of something that's jointed, it's harder to lift heavier things because you're putting a lot of strain on one area of the robot. In this case, it would be up here. Uh, and it can also be more maneuverable than an elevator because elevators, if you think about it, it's just straight up and down. So sometimes if you want to move, uh, reach something that's more forward, uh, it's a little bit difficult. So there's a couple of ways to get around that, but uh, that's what we mean by when we say that they're generally more maneuverable than an elevator. So again, this is Robonauts. So this is the same robot as earlier. You can see what their robot looks like. So this is actually a really phenomenal robot. They actually combine like an arm structure back here with an elevator. So that's really complicated, but it's very good at getting the job done. So we'll show you guys that. But you guys can sort of see, like it can go up and down, but it can also swing back and forth. Uh, and yes, like down here, this is an elevator. You can see that uh, they usually, when they did this, this was just to lift balls and discs, and the balls were all empty. So they weren't lifting like five pound things. Uh, they didn't put too much strain on it. But you can see it can move really easily. It moves really smoothly. Or, sorry, this is for a power up. But yeah, this is what uh, an arm sort of looks like. So for, for bar linkage, it's something I'd say is. Uh, pretty popular in FTC, I believe. I think I've seen it quite a few times. But a lot of people, though, use it in FRC too. I will say, though, for FRC, because just because of the nature of the four bar linkage, people usually don't use that as their primary arm. I saw this really interesting robot at Worlds one time uh, that uh, used it as like a way to deploy their intake. Uh, I haven't seen it too many times as the like main arm, just because F uh, four bar linkages can get pretty clunky if they're really big. Uh, so the benefit for the four bar linkage is it's sort of like the elevator where it keeps everything parallel. So especially if you have something like a claw at the end, when you're using something like a basic arm, the claw will just sort of uh, like not stay parallel, which could make it hard to place things. But the four bar linkage, it sort of acts like having an additional wrist. It'll keep everything parallel so it's the same orientation. And most basketball hoops actually use this if you look at the way that they're mounted to the poles. Uh, so this is sort of like an elevator in the sense that it keeps everything parallel, but you can also allow you to extend things out. So it's really handy. So, uh, yeah, I feel all uses this too because parallelograms are so simple. But if you just look at how it operates, you can just sort of see everything is kept parallel. So now elevators. 254 is another team that our team looks at a lot. 254 is also a really phenomenal team. This was actually their 2019 robot, and it actually had a pretty similar approach to what 118 just did uh, that I showed you like two slides ago. They had an elevator combined with an arm, so that usually allows you the best of both worlds, besides the fact that it's really complicated. So elevators can be used to raise and lower game pieces and other manipulators, uh, and it's very handy because you can do it in more uh, multiple stages. It's a lot more complex. And it can also be combined with other mechanisms, and you can actually lift pretty heavy things or pretty big things with elevators. Elevators are something that I think veterans are counting right now. 
Uh, elevators are a little bit more on the difficult side, I'd say, in CAD. Uh, so it's not one of the projects that we have you tackle right away. We usually have you like start from the bottom with drive frames and work your way up. But elevators are used pretty often. Our team actually used an elevator in 2019 to climb. Uh, and elevators, there's a lot of different variants. So for elevators or a cascade, where all sections rise together. So what we mean by that is uh, like when one stage rises one inch, the other stage rises one inch, and then uh, the other stage rises one inch. So it's not like you like have one up and then the other one moves up. Uh, they like all like sort of move up simultaneously. And it's based on like uh, with like a chain or belt or cable. It's linked like that. Uh, and it's sort of hard to see from this image here, but you'll be able to understand it more if you watch more videos uh, and see how, like, how people usually link cascades up. Continuous, on the other hand, it's with uh, each section rise separately. So it has one stage go up, and then the other stage goes up, and then the other stage goes up. So an elevator example, let's start with this one right here. So this is a multi-stage lifting mechanism. And you can sort of see here that this is just a one stage. But, um, yeah, it just goes up like that, and it goes down. Uh, so they're pretty compact, and it's really smooth. And this one used belts. And you see this one, too. So this is for FTC. Uh, this is sort of like a, this is not, this is a continuous one, so that's not a cascade. But you see each stage moves up separately, and it's really, really distinct. That's what an elevator can look like. Now scissor lifts. Scissor lifts are really uncommon. I have seen it attempted a couple of times in FTC, but in FRC, I don't think I've ever seen a robot with scissor lifts before. So it's sort of, you can consider it a type of elevator, and it can be very compact, but it's pretty unstable, uh, and it's hard to manufacture, it's hard to design, it's hard to build, it's hard to package, so we don't really ever use it. But it's something that's nice to know of. Okay. So now with shooters. Shooters are really popular because uh, just balls with ga games with balls in them are really popular because, you know, everything's mass moving. So shooters are something that are used really often. Uh, so most use flywheels, like we sort of discussed yesterday. And it's used primarily for balls, but you could theoretically use it for just, like, small game pieces where you have to move a lot of game pieces quickly. So... Uh, shooter types. Shooter, these aren't like official classifications really. Uh, I think lingo sort of varies from location to location. But generally, with you can have hooded shooter types. Uh, you can have hooded shooters. So this helps you uh, like maintain the angle that you're shooting at. So it's really uh, stable and steady. Uh, so you will generally see hooded ones. And they don't have to be one wheel. But what we mean by one wheel is the fact that uh, it usually only gets spun from one side. So you can think of it as one wheel or like one side of wheels. Uh, and it just gets spun from one side and it's um, shot up. So another type is like the demo wheel. So with this, we don't, you don't really see uh, like a hood. Instead, you see like two different sets of wheels or two different like areas of wheels that sort of push it out and propel it out. So turret is just uh, a flywheel like you just saw, um, just saw, but it's rotating. So you can see that this is like a big flywheel, and but at the bottom this round disc, this round disc it's sort of like uh, one of the things that can like rotate um, that you might see around. So it allows you to turn really quickly and shoot in multiple directions with ease, and this allows you to instead of like rotating your robot when you want to start shooting from this change. I'm shooting from this direction to this direction, you can just rotate the turret. And it's harder, uh, what would you mean by normal turret? It's just harder to design than a normal shooter in general, because you have to have this, that's extra motors, that's extra linkage, but sometimes uh, it's worth it, especially when shooting is your primary task and you have to do so in a lot of directions. Wait, Sonnet, mm -hmm. is, is the turret like the platform? Because on top of it is the hooded mechanism, right? Yeah. Is that the platform? Yeah. So turret, when we say turret, we usually refer, uh, like Mahima said, it's like the base, this like little sort of metal circle down here that can turn. That's what we usually mean by turret. This is like a turreted shooter. So up here, this is like the hooded shooter that we talked about earlier. Any other questions? Okay. So this is 
an example of a shooter. This is what our team had last year. Last year, our shooter wasn't turreted. Uh, that would have made it really, really complicated. We would have had to design, redesign a lot of it. But we did do a hooded shooter, and we actually have two different positions. So if you show, if we play this, you can see that we can uh, put, we can shoot things super, super fast. And uh, our, here are our flywheels, and they just get sort of spun up. So intake. So intakes are usually like a type of manipulator that we use to pick up and hold the game element. So they're usually like wheeled because that usually allows it to get taken in fast. And it's usually attached to the end of an arm or something, so it's deployed. Some uh, intakes are pneumatically actuated, so they can fit inside of a robot uh, because of size constraints. So if you see here, this is uh, our intake from last year or last two, uh, two years ago. And this is like a pneumatic tube that you can use to deploy it and then retract it. So if you look at our intake in action, so that's what it looks like when it's deployed. And that's what it looks like when you're uh, having it back in. And this is again 118. Uh, so 118, this is their intake. And you can see instead of wheels, they use rollers, which is also a really good option. And it is shown in this video, but they can also take their intake in and then pull it back out. So grippers are usually used to clamp down around an object. They're meant to be simple and robust. Usually you don't have to get too complicated. And just because like you're used to be clamping or grabbing onto something, a lot of times they're actuated by pneumatics. Pneumatics are pretty popular in FRC. So here's an example of a gripper. In this case, they were grabbing onto a really big object. So this is 226. Uh, they're grabbing onto a... And you can see down here, we combined it with an elevator, too, because we had to lift things up. I'll play that video again. So we're back here, 226. But yeah, we can grab stuff, lift stuff, and then put, push it over. Okay, yeah, so I think that actually just ends the slide. But does anyone have any questions on any of the mechanisms that I went over? Because I went through a lot of content. Okay, um, stop sharing. Uh, okay, let me, I'm just going to check for comprehension with you guys. So, let's see. Jeffrey or Anne Vivant. What was the most interesting mechanism that you saw, or what were your main takeaways from the slideshow? The main takeaway is like there's many different kind of types of mechanisms and like um, different kind of uh, structures you can use um, depending on the game. Um, one one might be the best for one game, and then one might be like insanely bad for another game. So. Yeah, for me it was like the most interesting one was the turret one i never really saw that one before and there are different mechanisms that could be used for the same task and you just got to try out which one would be the most efficient do you guys have a favorite mechanism not really yeah well okay yeah i know how you said you like the turret a lot okay so i'm going to get started with can now and I hope that was interesting to you guys and you guys also learned. So what we're going over today is a couple of things. So we're just we're just doing synthesis today. We're pulling everything together. So we're teaching you guys how to pull in like custom parts that you made and also download stuff off the web. So I'm going to start off by just sharing my screen again. And so if you guys remember, th these are a couple of uh distributors that i think drew talked about last time okay so we have andy mark expro and mcmaster so when we're doing stuff with motors you guys probably already figured this out but we obviously don't really make the motors in shop in house that would be a lot too much, uh, like way too much work and we don't have the bandwidth to do that and it's not allowed so we buy them right and we want to have really really accurate models in cad but it's sort of hard to just replicate something by just looking at a picture of it, especially when you're talking about something as complicated as a motor. 
So what we do for that is we actually download it off of uh, VEX. So just for example, this is a 775 Pro. This is something that our team likes to use a lot. So when we're trying to use something like this, how we usually use this, I'm going to show you, I'm going to just demonstrate with VEX. I don't know if I'm going to get around to any mark and McMaster, but this is, it's the same concept for everything. So for the VEX Pro, uh, for VEX at least, what you have to do is you have to scroll all the way down. There's this, right? And then you see this little tab called Cat Files. So this is what you're going to want to click. And back to this really nice thing where it also allows you to preview what it looks like, just so you can make sure that this is what you want. So for example, if you're going to be using this uh, and you want this, and you can say, oh, yes, this is exactly what I want. And you can go ahead and download it. So let me click Download here. So if you guys can see it, uh, start to download uh, the download process in the format of a step file. Actually, let me reshare my screen. Okay, so now I have Autodesk Inventor pulled up, and normally we just go straight to parts and start making stuff, but what we're going to do this time is actually a little bit different. We're going to open up assembly, which we haven't really played around with before. And what assembly allows us to do is, if you think of Legos, when we're making parts, we're making the individual Lego blocks, well, if we want to make something like a house or a robot, then we're going to have to combine a lot of parts together. That's what an assembly essentially is. So for assembly, what we're going to be doing now is we're going to be combining and pulling in a lot of different parts. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to click Place. And I just downloaded that. So it's going to be in my Downloads. Uh, and I'm going to go, you see there's a component files. What you want to do is go to all files down here and everything you've downloaded will show up. And you can go ahead and click 775 Pro. And if you click down the down arrow here, uh, yeah, just click that. So that's 775 Pro. So I went sort of fast for that, but are all of you guys there? Have all of you guys downloaded something? And then I'll pull it up. I'll give you guys a couple seconds to catch up if needed. So again, just download it and then go to uh, place in an assembly and then uh, click all files. And you can see if I hover over it, it's a step file. So just briefly, uh, Autodesk has a lot of its own custom files. So if you think of like component files, IPT or IAM, oh, those are like Autodesk files. But there's a lot of other CAD software. There's like Fusion, SolidWorks. On shape, those are all really popular, but uh, and to make something compatible across everything else, so like what you can think of as like a PDF of CAD, we have step files. So step files are really nice because you can export it and you can pull it in through basically every single CAD software, like every single major CAD software there is. I will say though, one of the downsides of step files are, or downsides or upsides, or maybe like pros or cons of a step file is you can't really go in and edit the part which is good for uh, like people like Vex who just want to give us a, a thing they don't want to show us like all the de very detailed inner workings. But sometimes if you're sharing uh, like CAD between teams or like within the team, you, ha you can't export it as a step file. You have to export it as an IPT, which can make it more complicated. I'm going to go ahead and click open. And this trips a lot of people up because they think there's something wrong. But uh, since you're converting types, so step is the universal format, right? But when Autodesk pulls it in, they don't want it to be universal format. They want it to be the Autodesk format. So you're going to have to just click OK here. And this usually takes a while, uh, depending on how large the step file is. Sometimes it can take a couple of minutes. And you click this. And you can see that I just placed one. And since I haven't clicked Escape, I can just keep on placing. And I can even like right click. I can rotate it along the z-axis, along the y-axis, along the x-axis. I can just keep on placing until I don't want to anymore. And then when I'm done, I can either just uh, right-click, click, click cancel, or I can just click escape. And, and then sort of similarly, you can just select one. I don't really want all of these. I only want a couple of them. So I'm going to select all these and just delete them. Okay. And now you can see there's one right here. Is everyone here?
So you guys have been making like a little assembly today. So it's sort of imperative that you guys catch uh, like I guess uh stay on top of it because I'm going over a lot today. So now you can see this can move around a lot. And that's fine for now. But sometimes when we're doing uh, other like drive trains or the pieces, it's really annoying that the whole thing can just move around. Because there's not really like a origin to constrain something to. So in that case, what you do is you will right click this and you can click grounded. And with that, uh, you see there's this little like thumbtack that showed up here. And now you can't move this anymore. So when we're doing grounded things as a rule of thumb, when we're doing assemblies, you really only want to ground one part in the entire assembly. Everything else should also not really be able to move, but it should be not able to move because you constrained it relative to the original piece that you grounded. And usually when we're grounding pieces, we don't want to like ground little pieces like gears or motors like I'm doing in this case. We don't want to ground something big, like a big piece of metal or a big piece of like, or like a drivetrain that you imported. And besides just importing uh, like parts, you can also import assemblies. So you can pull assemblies into assemblies and parts into assemblies. So does everything that I uh, talked about make sense to everyone? Okay, sounds good. So now I'm going to show you guys uh, one more thing with us. For assemblies, basically our main thing is just importing things and then constraining things together. So this is con the constraint tool. There's a lot of different options, like for all of this. We basically never use constraint set or translational. We okay, we very rarely use motion. We don't really, because usually we don't have time to get around to this. This is usually more just doing something like a gear. Uh, usually the main thing that we use is just uh, assembly. And we honestly won't even use angle or offset or insert or symmetry. We just use angle, uh, we just use mate, which is right here. And mate, you see there's two types. You can either mate or just flush. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to just click this. I can control C. Also really handy. I'm going to show you guys how to constrain things. So one very common type of constraint that we'll do is axis, right? So if you think of something like when you're inserting a gear into a shaft, that's an axis, right? Because you want it to be constrained along an axis. And like it allows for rotation and stuff like that. So uh, if you want to constrain access, you just click constrain right here, mate, and you click uh, this. And if you hover over something circular like this, Autodesk is really smart. I can tell that you want to do it like that. And then if you want to uh, constrain it to, for instance, I want to constrain these two together, you just click this. And it makes this really nice little sound. And you can see, it's sort of hard to tell here, but they constrained it together. And you can play around with this if you want like it to be constrained like in this direction where the axes are opposed or if they're aligned. Uh, you can really just play around with this. If I click OK or apply, you can see now that it's constrained on that axis. So this one was grounded, so it can't move no matter what. But now this one is sort of like constrained, right? So now let's say I want the back of these two to touch. So how would I do something like that? Well, this is also another really common type of constraint because if you think of something like uh, when you're like putting when you're bolting together a metal, metal frame, that's not really an axis constraint. That's sort of a face constraint. So what you want to do there um, is instead of clicking an axis, you just select a face. That is as simple as that. So let me select. Actually, I don't want to show you that yet. Uh, I'm going to select this back face right here. And I'm going to use this cube. I'm going to select this back face right here, and bam, they're touching. So you click OK, and then you can see that it's rotating and also touching. So do you see how I'm progressively constraining it and letting it move off and left? OK, so finally, something that I want to show you. This is a little counterintuitive, uh, because after I constrain it like this, it's not going to be able to rotate anymore. But let's just say that I wanted these two tops to align perfectly like this, right? So I can't really do what I just did like with this, because if I click OK, it's going to give me an error, right? Because you can't have like the two faces touching like this, but also have them touching like this, like a sandwich. So in this case, if you want them to just, the two planes to just face in the same direction, you would use the flush tool. So you can sort of see, may, uh, f um, like make the two planes like this, but flush makes the two uh, planes align. So I'm just going to click this and this, and I'm going to click flush. Click OK. That's what I want to do. Okay, so that's 
so when you have bad uh, when you have bad constraints like this, so you can see like I sort of forced it earlier, you want to go back and delete them because otherwise they're going to give you a lot of issues later on. So now I'm going to click constraint, I'm going to click this top base, I'm going to the bottom, and I'm going to click this, okay, and I'm going to click flush. Accept relationship. And you can see now that these two are flushed. And the reason that it's giving me a little bit of error is actually because it's not like perfectly designed. Uh, as in like the axes are actually uh, made in a way so that everything will line up properly. And sometimes Autodesk just gives you dumb errors like that. Because it's sort of redundant. Uh, you can't really like flush something and constrain it like that because it stops it from rotating. So Autodesk is having a little bit of an issue with that. So since I don't really actually want it to rotate anymore, what I can do here is right click this constraint and click suppress or delete it. I'm just going to suppress it in this case. And since that's suppressed, if I do this and I click recover, oh no, that's not what I want to do. Actually, I'm do this. I will suppress this. So I suppressed it. So now you can see that like that's not really there. And now it looks like it's not constrained at all. Right, it just looks like it's moving. But if I do look from the top, you can see I can't actually move it up and down, and that's because of this main constraint that I made earlier. And then if I unsuppress this, it's going to still be over there. Okay. Anyway, uh, sometimes Autodesk just does stuff like that. Usually it's not that big of a deal. You can either, uh, for cases like this, you can either just find a way to do a different constraint, or you can just leave it be, but you have to be careful then when you're moving or adding new constraints on there. Okay, so those are mate, uh, like along the axis, uh, flushing and mating two planes. So does anyone have any questions? Okay, so the final thing I'm going to show you guys is how to save stuff. So when you save stuff, you can save the active file, and Autodesk will default save as an IAM, and that's what you usually want to do. But sometimes if you're going to be sharing a large file and you don't really want someone to be able to go in and edit everything precisely and change other constraints and change other relationships, what you can actually do is instead of saving it, you will click export, and you can export it as a PDF image. So PDF exports as a PDF, so it's just like a, it's basically like an image but a PDF. Image is just like a picture of what you're working with. You can also export it in a CAD file, a CAD format. So this, on the other hand, it will allow you to um, export it as like an STL, STP, like a DWG, which is like a drawing file, and a bunch of other stuff. So it allows you to have a lot of flexibility. And usually sometimes, uh, when we're submitting homework too, since we don't really want, we don't really need to be able to see everything in really like fine detail, and we don't want to take up that much space with like a bunch of like IAM files because they take longer to load as well because they have more information. We just have you submit as a step file. You can go ahead. Uh, sorry, do you want to go over the naming on the name files right now or here? Say that again. Do you want to go over our files right now or for the naming system? Uh, I don't think I don't think we'll the naming system for later. Okay. So does anyone have any? Options on what I just did. Also, I just want to like emphasize how there's like basically two things, right? That you use in assembly, which is like constraint using mate or flush. And if you guys didn't notice, like she uh, saw it all with them faces because that um, blocks like that dimension. Yeah, I, Drew, I think you're cutting out a little bit for me. Yeah, hey, Drew, you, you were cutting out quite a bit. Um, so I don't know if it's your mic or your Wi Fi. You guys have any questions? Yeah, I'm not seeing you. Can you hear me? Okay. Um, 
So I think one final thing that I'm going to show you guys today, it's very simple, just to synthesize everything that you guys have already learned today, is I'm going to build a little metal frame. So I don't really want to say this one, just because you know, but you guys can say it if you want. So I'm going to go through this pretty fast, because this should be pretty, uh, just try to like cat along and see if you can keep up with me. And if you can't, uh, I'm obviously not going to speed through it. So if you guys have any questions, feel free to send me down. So I'm just going to talk it through basically. So we're going to do something, we're going to be making some, starting off making the frame with something called VersaFrame. So VersaFrame is something that our, our team uses a lot. Uh, it's like the, it's like the basic metal tubing that FRC teams use. So the way that I'm going to make it is I'm going to start off by making a rectangle. Offset it. So I'm going to do inward by 0.1. 0 0.1 0 .1 is always the um, thickness of VersaFrame. You guys might want to remember that. You can see everything is black. Nothing can move. So I'm going to go ahead. Okay. Uh, I'm going to look through. Okay. So in a couple of seconds, you guys can see we have a metal tube. So now I'm going to start another 2D sketch up here. Right. And then we're going to do a uh, project geometry just to project the sides. Right. So now you can see the left sides showed up. I'm going to draw a circle in here. So the circle, um, the size is going to be 0 0.188. It's basically always the size. You guys don't have to memorize this, but you would just pick up on it eventually. I'm just going to dimension this relative to the uh, edges that I just projected geometry of. 0 0.5 this way, 0 0.5 this way. Okay. I can see the circle is black, you can't move it. So now I have an option. So the last efficient way of doing it right now would be to pattern this as a circle here. And I would do five. And then one part, so I would put five. So this is what I could do, right? I could finish sketch, and then I could go ahead and extrude. But then you can think, usually with FRC we have big robots. If it's like 20 inches, I don't really want to go and manually like select this, this, and this, and this, and this. So what I'm going to show you guys instead is although you can do it like that, what I'll be doing is I will be, so I'm going to make the extrusion one inch, flip it so it's a cut extrusion, so it's cutting through. Actually, it should be two inches. Okay. So I'm going to cut through, I'm going to click OK, so I have one single hole. And what I'm going to do instead is do a rectangular pattern in the 3D dimension. This is generally your better option. Maybe five. So there we go. Really simple verse frame. So I just gonna name it Versa frame. And you can see it's later than IPT. Uh, this is like the default and measure part. We'll be going over naming system uh, for the build season more in detail later, but for now, this is all we're gonna do. So now we save. I'm gonna go home and I'm gonna start an assembly. Okay, so now I'm gonna place CAD file. So instead of doing all models, you want to scroll to all files. You can see this is the Versa frame that I just saved and I just made. And if you click it, there's a nice preview. If you click this, there's no preview because this is a step file. But since this is an Autodesk and Bender file, there's going to be a preview, which is really handy. I'm going to place, I'm going to make a frame, so I'm going to have four pieces. Okay, escape. And as you can see, this is one visual style, but usually in CAD, like the leads, we highly suggest you not to look at it like this because sometimes it can be a little bit hard to see, uh, especially when you're like share, you're screen sharing and then it's from different people. Uh, it's from farther away. So what we suggest you go is uh, go to is view, and you're gonna change this view style from shaded, smooth shaded model uh, to shaded with edges, and you can instantly see there's like a huge difference. Uh, what Inventor does is it like draws a little black line along everything. So this is usually what we suggest you guys do. So I'm going to go to I'm going to go to assemble, click constraint. All of you guys are here with me right now. I didn't lose anyone to die. Okay. So I'm going to start constraining stuff. So I want those two to touch. Apply. I want these two to like face the same direction. Apply. Okay. Now this is an excellent example of why you ground pieces. Because if you saw earlier, when I constrained these two together, this piece moved to fit the location of this piece. 
Uh, and maybe that's not what I wanted. Maybe instead of moving this piece down, what I actually wanted is for this piece to move up. You can see also when I'm moving stuff, like it's moving in this structure too, which is super annoying. So in this case, I'm going to choose to ground just one piece. Okay? And again, this looks like it's randomly moving, but if you look at it from the top one, you can see it's actually moving in a pretty orderly manner. Uh, and it also can move up and down. So now if I click Constrain, I can uh, move things nicer. So I'm going to make these two tops, but I want it to be flush, right? Apply, and I want these two to flush. Click OK. So now you see th these two are fully constrained to each other. Now I have an option. I could do the same repetitive thing for these two pieces and then combine them. Or I could do something more smart. I could select it, Control-C, Control-V. You can see when it's pasted, it already has all of these constraints, which is really handy. It saves a lot of time. I didn't know this when I just started catting, so I wasted a lot of time. But now you see we have two sets of exactly the same constrained stuff. And what we can do now is flush this face, this face, flush it though, so it's the same orientation, apply, and then we can do this. We will flush this face, no. Oh, if you, oh, let me show you guys that again. So if you actually select the wrong thing, instead of like clicking cancel, you can just click this first selection again to just reselect. So let me select this plane, okay on this side, and I want it to be flush with this. Click OK. And you can see now, if I look from the top, it's a really nice cube. And if I look from the front, or maybe like this, it, it can't move up and down. OK? So I have this final dimension. And for this, I'm just going to mate this or this. Okay, and there we have it. Really fast, really simple, really easy. Everything that I, we've taught you basically up um, until now uh, with, you know, uh, constraining and everything. There's a button. So basically, with Autodesk, it's, a lot of times it's just about working smart because there's a lot of ways to speed a lot of the stuff that you're doing up substantially. So does anyone have any questions? We wanted to show you. Okay, uh, something else that I'll show you. You guys can do this. Just show. It'll show all the different constraints that are acting on a specific bar, right? So you can see that this one has four. It's mated, it's flushed, it's mated, it's flushed. And then if you want to turn that off, then you're just going to click hide all because usually those little icons get sort of annoying. Okay. Uh, so, do you guys want to turn your cameras on so for attendance purposes we can at the end, just to see who's there? So, just by like show of hands, raise your hand if you feel comfortable with the material that I just went over today. It's okay to be honest, because if you're not comfortable, we will spend time going over everything again. So, Vivon, are you comfortable with what we just went over today? Well, kind of. I'm still in like, yeah, I get some parts and some parts I still need work with, so. Okay. I think with CAD, it's, I think unfortunately a lot of times CAD just comes with practice. So you, it's hard to improve like with someone else unless you practice a lot by yourself, which is why usually right after boot camp, we'll throw you guys into a project that's uh, like sort of difficult, definitely for beginner CADers. It takes a lot of trial and error. We're going to make you guys make a gearbox. Uh, that's still a couple weeks ahead. But um, CAD, I think, just comes with practice. So after you guys make things a couple times, it'll get easier. Okay. So I think those are the main things that I just wanted to go over with you guys today. Mechanisms and assemblies. So does anyone have any questions with anything? Also, I just want to quickly say that, um, okay, just like deal with my Wi-Fi issues. Um, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, um, we like looked at like whole robots and things like that, and we've only spent about four days um, looking at like 
inventor and things like that, right? So don't expect to know the entirety of the robot. We're going to spend the entire off season learning the like other aspects. So all you have to focus on are like the basics that we covered in inventor and just know how, um, know the general idea of how a robot works. No need to like go over into the details um, in these four days. Okay. So like if you guys are a little scared of what's going to come, like uh, you don't have to know everything by now, just like the general idea. Yeah. And it's actually really nice because Really, we've taught you most of the, uh, basically all the CAD skills that you actually need to know for the upcoming season. So we taught you all, like, all the ways to use Inventor in uh, that we're going to be going over. Right now, all that's left for you guys in terms of CAD is just practice and doing projects and maybe finding ways to customize Inventor to make it work the best for you. And then for the rest of the season, we'll just be working on strategy and looking at the robots, looking at other mechanisms, talking about engineering design principles and what makes a robot good. Uh, so on and so forth. Okay. So I think with that, I will talk about homework. So now that you guys know that, I think something that I want you guys to make is a Versa frame cube. So that metal tubing that I showed you guys how to make, that's a that's called Versa frame. And I want you guys to use that to make a cube and send a picture. And this time I don't want you guys to send a picture to Drew like we have been early, doing earlier. I want you guys to send a step file, so an, uh, a step file to Drew. So remember for that, you can't just save it, you have to export it as a step file, okay? So I want you guys to be doing that. Uh, so the VersaTrain cube is what we're going to be doing. And then on Friday, we'll be doing a test. And we do, we will look at your test score and how often you've been submitting homework and your attendance and whether or not you like turning your camera on and stuff in the long run. But even if the test tomorrow is a little bit hard for you, don't worry, because if you feel like we didn't cover it, that's fine, uh, because if you feel like we didn't cover it, or you feel like it's too hard, other people are probably around the same level. This is just to gauge your knowledge in general um, in terms of what you have learned so far in camp and how much you've taken away. So the final thing today, I guess Rishi uh, is one of our design leads, and you guys don't really know Rishi. So Rishi, do you want to turn your camera on and introduce yourself? So I'm actually on my student account, so I can't turn on my camera, but yeah, I've been the lead for the past three years, and I'll be a senior this year. If you guys play tennis, you've probably seen me before. I doubt you guys play tennis, though. Um, yeah. Yeah. So that's not, not Rishi's been with the team for four years. He's been in design lead for three years. So he's a lot of experience. So if you guys have questions, make sure to ask Rishi. Uh, Rishi's also a senior too, which is really nice in terms of experience. Okay, so I think that's all that I have for you guys today. Versa Frame Cube due tomorrow to Drew's email, and then we'll take the test. And probably, I think tomorrow our main agenda item besides taking the test is beforehand. We will uh, do a game, we won't do a game analysis, but we will do a robot analysis. Okay, so yeah, thank you guys all for coming today, and I think that's all we have for you. You guys are free to go now. Stay behind if you have questions. All right, good job, guys. Bye.